Revelation is a book that a lot of people are confused about, a lot of people don't understand. But it's really not that difficult when you begin to see certain things uh, and you see from a, a right perspective. You remember we talked about how that Revelation is a blessing book. There's a special blessing for those who uh, read and those who uh, uh, listen and those who hear the book of Revelation. So it's a special blessing. We Just in way of review, you remember we talked about how that there was a rapture, how uh, we believe that the rapture takes place before all the trouble of the tribulation. And John saw the Lord sitting on the throne and he saw uh, a scroll in his hand. And the scroll had seven seals. Can anybody tell me, does anybody remember what that scroll represents? That scroll represented the title deed to the earth. Who's in control of the earth right now? Who's the king of the earth? It's not Jesus, is it? It's Satan. You remember when Jesus stood before Pilate? And he said, are you a king? And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was so, I'd come and my, my followers would conquer you. Now that's going to happen one day. As a matter of fact, Jesus is taking back control of the earth. And that's what the book of Revelation is about. So we see in chapter 9 where we saw one of the most horrifying chapters in all the Bible. Last week was really, I don't think there is a chapter in the Bible that is as horrible as last week's chapter. We saw uh, demons. The Bible says that Satan will come out of heaven, out of the sky... And he will have the keys that God will give him. Jesus will give him the keys to hell. He will open up the bottomless pit, the abyss. That's the place where people go right now when they die. The devil has never been in hell. He will one day, but he's not been in hell. He's been able to go to God and talk to God. He's up in heaven. He's in the air. He can can move about and do whatever he wants to right now. But he goes down. He opens up the bottomless pit. And the Bible says that these creatures come out and their purpose is for five months to torture man. They have uh, tails like scorpions, they have teeth like lions, and they are compared to locusts, but they're demonic creatures and they will attack the inhabitants of the earth for five months. And then, and that was one of the, uh, you remember we were talking about the trumpets, we're in the trumpets. And then the next trumpet was there was going to be a kingdom from the east an army of 200 million people that will come towards Jerusalem getting ready for the battle of Armageddon. So that, that's kind of the picture. Have you ever said to yourself, it can't get much worse? I don't know about you, but I had one of those weeks. Uh, I had uh, one day my water heater broke, then my air conditioner broke, and then my car messed up this week. <laughs> and it was one of those weeks where I'm like, what's going to go wrong today? And, uh, oh, my garage door won't open right, now, even now. So uh, uh, it's one of those days where you say, could it get any worse? And I tell you, after looking at last week's chapter, chapter 9, you would say, could it get any worse? But let me tell you something. Our God is so good that He, in chapter 10, is going to give us some encouragement and chapter 10 I've entitled it an encouraging interlude it is what we call a parenthetical statement now let me tell you the book of revelation is like seeing something in two scenes you have the scene on earth and the scene up in heaven And so here's what happens often. God is telling us what's happening on the earth, and he says, let's take a break, hold up, time out. Now let's look up to heaven and see what's happening. So we've been looking at earth. We've been looking at all the plagues. The sea is going to turn to blood. We talked about the rivers of water will be poisoned. The Bible says, totally with all the plagues, over half of the population of the earth will be killed. They'll be dead. We've got all this bad news. And so now we're getting ready for the seventh trumpet. 
But notice God does this. When he was doing the seals, he did six seals and then parenthetical statement. And what did he do? The Bible gives us a statement of what's going on. And it says that he sealed 144,000 Jewish virgins. They're, they're virgins. Next time that uh, a Jehovah Witness knocks on your door and says, I'm one of the 144,000. Well, you can ask him, what tribe is he? Because he has to be Jewish. And then you could ask him if he's a virgin. If he's not, he can't be one of the 144,000. Because the Bible says, we'll look at it later, but it, it says they were not defiled by women. And so you've got these evangelists. These are men, 144, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And God lets them go out and preach the gospel. They are evangelists. Why? Because many of the Jews are going to be saved during the tribulation. And uh, the Bible says they will look at whom they have pierced and, and they will weep. They will see that they were wrong. And the Jews are going to come to Christ and it's going to be great revival. But it won't be just the Jews. It will be other people. But mainly the tribulation is to bring the Jews back to God. And so these guys are going to preach. But we have an interlude. A little parenthetical statement. And then here we are about to hit to the seventh trumpet. And we have the same thing. Here's an interlude. All of a sudden what's going on. Now this chapter gives us really more questions than it has answers. And we don't know for sure. This morning, I want us to put our Sherlock Holmes cap on and get our magnifying glass out because we got to look at some clues of what the Bible says so we can figure out what he's talking about. Because, And by the way, some of this stuff, we're not sure. We can speculate, but we're going to look at the clues to try to find out. Here's some questions that we have. It starts out with a mighty angel. Who is this mighty angel? Number two, it says there are seven thunders. What are the seven thunders? And then it says that there talks about a little book. What is this little book? And then it talks about the mystery of God. What is the mystery of God? So uh, we're going to look at these clues and try to find out. Now, here's some things when you study the Bible. And I'm glad we're teaching like this today because I want to teach you how to study your Bible some. One, when you read something, it has to be in context. You know, I could take a verse and says, Judas hung himself. And there's another verse in the Bible that says, go thou and do likewise. If that was true, we'd all go out and hang ourselves. But... I've took those two out of context. You can't take the Bible out of context. You've got to read what's in front of it and what's behind it and what's beside it and all around it. And you take what the Bible's saying in context. Also, you compare other scripture with scripture. If there's a word in the Bible, you want to look and see what does this word mean in other places of the Bible. And so we'll look at that also. So who is this angel? There's an angel talking. I'm going to read it in verse 1 in just a minute. Let me say this about angels. And I tell you, studying Revelation has really perked my interest in angels. The word angel is mentioned over 60 times in the book of Revelation. There are angels and they are real. There are good angels and there are fallen angels. There are angels that are free to move about today. There are fallen angels that are free to move about. The Bible says, last week we talked about, there are some angels that are chained in the pit of hell and they cannot be released, at least not yet, until, until the time of judgment. And we talked about the difference between those. Um, there were some angels that lusted after women on earth and had relations with women on earth and God was so displeased that he punished them and he chained them up and they're not free to go. But we do know some angels are free because when, Peter, when uh, Daniel prayed in the book of Daniel, it took 21 days for him to get his answer. Why? Because a demon, uh, I say demon, a fallen angel was fighting with uh, Gabriel to get him the message and they were fighting. So there's angels that fight. There's a war going on. There are angels that protect us. Y'all remember Clarence, the angel? 
uh, you know, every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. Now, I don't know about all that stuff, but uh, um, the Bible does say that angels are constantly looking at the face of God, ready to obey. If God says, go, they go. The Bible talks about how angels watch out for little children. The Bible says we have entertained angels unaware. You say, Brother Carl, have you ever entertained an angel? I'm unaware of it if I have. Uh, I, I don't know. Could have. The Bible says some have done that. Have entertained angels. You might have had an angel in your house and fed them. I'd hate to tell them no, wouldn't you, if it was an angel? But anyway, the angels are throughout the book of Revelation. But we're talking about a mighty angel. Now, I want you to look at Revelation chapter 10. Okay, get your Bibles out. We're going to look in the Word. Verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel. Your, your version might say strong. Anybody else have another word there for angel? I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet were as pillars of fire. So who in the world is this angel? We're going to look at some of the clues, okay? Number one under that, if you're taking notes, his descent. He descended down from where? Heaven. Now that gives us a clue. It, it's not a, a solid clue because we're going to read in just a couple more chapters that uh, Satan is going to be cast down from heaven. So, And Satan is not a good angel. But we believe in the context when it says that he is coming down from heaven. We believe this is a good angel. By the way, does anybody know what the word angel means? It means messenger. Messenger. So, is this Michael? Well, the Bible says that the seven trumpets were blown by seven angels. And many people believe these are seven archangels. There are seven archangels never mentioned in the Bible, but if you read the book of Enoch, which is not one of the uh, books of the Bible, but it is a book that gives great credibility. Jesus quoted it. It's mentioned in the book of uh, Jude. But he mentions seven archangels. They, they all, all of them rhyme. Gabriel, Michael, Raphael. I don't know the rest of them, but they all rhyme. But this says another angel. So I don't believe it's Michael. And there's some people who believe it's maybe another archangel. That may be. There are some people, many people, believe this is talking about Jesus. And we're going to look at some clues in just a minute. Jesus sometimes in the Old Testament appeared as an angel. Can anybody remember a time? Okay, Jacob. Um, the three Hebrew children, you remember when they were in the fire? It says there's another one in there, and who does he look like? Son of God. That was Jesus. Um, you remember Joseph, uh, Joshua, the captain that stood before him when he was praying? And the, he said, get up and quit praying. How many times would God say that? There's a time to pray, and there's a time to get up and work and fight. Those are called, I'm going to give you a million dollar word here, okay? In theology, that is called a Christophany. A Christophany is a, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. Now, you know, you, you know, little kids learn, well, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. That's where Jesus began. No, Jesus was before the earth ever was created. Jesus came to earth as a baby, but Jesus was alive forever. He was alive before our human mind can even comprehend. So who is this angel? We believe maybe that it might be Jesus himself. Number two, I want you to see his description. Letter A, he's in a cloud. Now this gives us some clue, doesn't it? Do you remember when God was leading the children of Israel in the, in the wilderness? What did he appear to them as? A cloud. When, when Moses met with God up on Mount Sinai, how did he, what, what was he in? He was in a cloud. 
When Jesus ascended up in Acts chapter 1, He ascended up into what? The clouds. Boy, y'all are doing great, I tell you. Um, when He comes again, the Bible says this same Jesus will return in like matter and He will what? Return in the clouds. You remember the song we sing? I love this song. We don't sing it much. Behold, He comes Riding on a cloud. You know that comes from a, a minor prophet. I think it's Joel. Not sure exactly. But it talks about he will be riding a cloud. Now he's going to be riding a horse too. But he's going to be in the clouds. And so here's this angel. And uh, it talks about he is clothed in a cloud. So could this be Jesus? But then look what else it says. Be under that. It says he was, there was a rainbow above his head. Do you know back in chapter 4, when we got the throne room in Revelation chapter 4, chapter 5, it says there was a rainbow above the throne. Do you remember what the rainbow represents? The rainbow represents the promise that God made to earth that he'd never flooded again. Not the whole earth. He did say he'd do Antioch, okay? <laughs> Antioch and Bellmead and, you know, Brent, uh, what is it, Bellevue. Uh, no, th there are local floods, but there's never been a universal flood. There was at one time. And that's why they have, um, I, don't, I don't need to go into all of this, but that's why they'll find some animals, prehistoric animals, frozen. That's why I believe the dinosaurs became extinct, because after the flood, they could not survive in a non tropical climate which I believe the, the, wor the whole world was tropical even in the North Pole South Pole and that's a whole nother sermon I don't need to get into that the rainbow was a covenant let her see his face is shining his face is like the sun who could this be can you think of anybody else who had a shining face what about Paul when he was saved you remember Paul was riding down the road to Damascus and it knocked him off his horse. He saw something so bright and it was Jesus. And Jesus talked to him. And it was so bright that it blinded him temporarily. And so this uh, light, you remember when uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, they said his face shone. The Bible says Jesus is called the Son of Righteousness, S-U-N, because He is bright, He is glorious, He is shining. So right now, if we're Sherlock Holmes, we're looking at the evidence, who is this angel? There's quite a few clues that say this is Jesus. And then it says He has feet like pillars of fire. Have we heard this before? Yes, we have. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus is described as having feet of fire, pillars of fire. What does that represent? Judgment. The judgment of God. Okay, so we see his descent. He came out of heaven. We've seen his description. Letter 3, his deeds. What's he doing? What's his angel doing? Look at, look at verses 2 and 3. And he had in his hand a little book open. And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roared. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Okay, so get the picture here. This mighty angel, rainbow, his face is shining. He's got the cloud around him. His feet are like fire. And he's standing one foot on the sea and one foot on the earth. Now some people say, well this couldn't be Jesus because Jesus doesn't come back until He comes back to conquer the earth later on in Revelation when He will take control and so this couldn't be Jesus. But we need to remember this is a vision. This is a vision of Jesus. This is a vision. It's like John is seeing a movie. He's seeing a vision of what's happening. So it's, it's, it's uh, symbolic. But what does it mean? It says he holds an open book in his hand. When is the last time we talked about a book in the book of Revelation? It was back in chapter 6. You remember where the seven scrolls? 
Notice what it says. It was a what kind of book? Open book. Why was it open? Because the seals have already been opened. This is the title deed of earth. This is all that God is explaining to John, and John is seeing it. And so, who holds the book in his hand? You remember John said, who is worthy to open the seals? And they looked in heaven, they looked on earth, they looked under the earth. What's under the earth? The pit of hell. And it says there was no one worthy to open the book. And John began to cry. He began to weep. No one's worthy. And then they said, John, quit crying. There is one worthy. Here comes the Lamb of God. And Jesus comes. And he was the only one worthy to open the book. And so now he's got the open book in his hand. That tells me this sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Then it says he stands on the sea and on the land. Now, what does that mean? Boy, there's all kinds of theologians that say, you know, this means the Jews and this means the Gentiles. And all. But really, the Bible doesn't say that. We've got to be careful about saying things what the Bible doesn't say. When the Bible speaks, I need to speak. When the Bible is silent, I need to be silent. So what does that mean? Here's what I believe it means. We're going through this awful period of tribulation and Jesus is saying, I want y'all to know something. I got one foot on the sea and one foot on the land. You know what that means? That means this is mine now. This is mine. It means ownership. It means sovereignty. It means I am in control. You remember when God told Joshua, he said, Joshua... I want you to go in the promised land and wherever the sole of your foot lands, it's yours. That's your land. When I was a young preacher at our very first church plant, we started a church. We were meeting in a daycare much like like this. We'd set up chairs. We did that for about a year, maybe. I don't know if it, maybe, maybe a little longer than a year. I was in my little office there praying, Lord, we need, we need a place to meet. I get a phone call. Brother Carl, there's a church that's closing down and they might be willing to sell their property. Now, we didn't have any money. We got, we got, this church has more money than we had then. We didn't have anything hardly. He said, would you be interested in buying that church? I said, I sure would. We didn't have any money. How am I going to buy a church building? And I remember Stephen was just a little boy. Stephen wasn't even, maybe, not even first grade, I don't think. So I said, Stephen, get, come on, let's go. Daddy, we're going to look at a church. He told me where it was. And I drove out there and I pulled in and it was late Friday night. Just right before it got dark, maybe at twilight. And I pulled into the parking lot and I saw that church. And I remember this verse, wherever the foot, the sole of your foot shall tread, I'll give you the land. And so you know what I did? I took my shoes off, got out of the car, I said, come on, Stephen. And he held my hand and we walked around that whole church property. And I said, God, give it to us. I know we don't have any money, but Lord, we need a place to meet. Lord, we need a place. It would sure help our little church if we had this building. And Lord, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. You could give it to us. We got in contact with that church, and there was maybe six people at that church. Six or seven. I'm not sure exactly how many. And they said, we we can't. We're going to close down. And I said, what would you sell it for? And they said, well, you know, we can't keep the money. It's a church. He said, i tell you what, we owe about $15,000. If you'll take over that, that debt, you can have it. And I said, we'll take over the debt. $15,000 for a building worth a quarter of a million dollars? I ain't very smart, but I'm not that stupid. I mean, that's a deal. What did we do? We said, we'll take it. And there was a lady who went to that church, and she 
had loaned the church about 15000 to do some repairs to the church. And uh, I said, we will, can we make payments to you to pay that off? And she said, yeah, you can make payments. So, boy, we got that church building. We were so happy. And I remember that lady started coming to our church, and she came up to me one Sunday, and she said, Brother Carl, I believe God wants me to give you that 15000 Just forget about it. And this was a widow woman. And I said, no, that ain't right. We, we said we'd pay you. We're going to pay you. About a month or two later, she comes back and she said, Brother Carl, the truth is, for years we didn't tithe. Me and my husband didn't tithe. He was dead. And uh, most widows, they are dead, aren't they? Uh, so uh, I told you all I wasn't stupid, but I said I didn't know. Much. But uh, anyway, uh, she said, I, I really would feel good if y'all would just erase that debt. It's like the Holy Spirit said, Buddy, I'm trying to answer your prayer if you'll accept it. And I said, Okay, we'll accept it. So we actually got that building for just a little bit of money that we paid her for a few months. But the Bible says, Everywhere you put your foot, that'll be yours. Isn't it amazing how God takes care of us? You know, I'll have something come up. Oh, how am I going to deal with that? And God will take care of it. God is so good. But here he is. He, he's standing, one foot on the sea, one foot on the land. He's saying, I own this. I own this. This is mine. Don't get nervous. We're almost through. Okay? So God is saying, all right, I know things are bad. I know there's demons down there stinging people with a scorpion tail. I know that there's a war. There's going to be Armageddon. Half the people have died. But those of you that love me, those of you that are Christians, I want you to know I'm in control of the land and the sea. Don't you worry. And then see, he says he roars like a lion. He roars like a lion. This, I believe this is Jesus. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he roars. The Bible says that he thundereth out marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he which cannot be comprehended. Jesus is saying, I'm in control. Isn't that good? You know when the Antichrist comes on the scene? And we're going to look at that in, in chapter 13, the Antichrist. And we're going to talk about the Antichrist. But do you know who gives the Antichrist his power? God does. It says, and it was given him for a little time. It was given him authority. It was given him. Who gave it to him? God did. You know, the devil can't do anything unless God lets it happen. And God is allowing this to happen on the earth. You know, when it comes to politics, some of you may not uh, care much for Mr. Obama. Some of you may like him. I personally don't care much for him. But you know who put him in power? God did. I don't know why, but for some reason God said, maybe we deserve him, okay? <laughs> that may be right. But God is in control. God allows all this to happen. You say, Brother Carl, things are going to get bad. Things are getting bad. The economy's bad. I tell you why. Part of it is God's judgment. God's in control. Why is this happening to me? Well, what have you done for God recently? The truth is, none of us deserve anything but hell. No matter what God does to us. And all of us are going to go through rough times, the good and the bad. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. You say, well, I'm a good person, so good things should happen to me. That ain't how it works. Let's go real quick. Yeah, y'all see all these numbers and you're scared, but I'm, I'm going to, I told y'all I'd get y'all out early, so I am. Number one, I want you to see the sealed thunders. Look at verse 4. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which are the seven thunders. Utter and write them not. Now this is the first time John is told, don't write it. There were seven seals. There were seven trumpets. There's going to be seven bowls of judgment. There are also seven thunders. And God says, don't write about it. Now here's the question. Whenever God says, <laughs> when God doesn't want to reveal something, everybody wants to know what it is. What are the seven thunders? I don't know. I don't have a clue, and you don't know, and nobody knows, and nobody's going to know because God said, seal it up. But I wonder how awful these may be that God won't even tell us about it. 
So there's going to be seven things happening during the tribulation that nobody knows is what's going to happen. Number two, I want you to see the sworn testimony. Look at verse 5. And the angel which I saw stand on the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear to him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are, are therein and the earth and the things that are therein and the sea and the things which are therein and there should be time no longer. We're going to look at that one in just a minute. But I want you to see this angel lifts his hand toward heaven and says, I swear. And you say, Brother Carl, you're not supposed to swear. Well, we're not supposed to swear. Because we ought to be telling the truth all the time. We shouldn't have to say, I'm telling you the truth. Because you should be telling the truth. You shouldn't have to tell you're telling the truth. Because you're always telling the truth. You understand? If you do, explain that to me, okay? But uh, Hebrews 6.13 says this. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore to himself. God swore upon God. Now, when you swear, that means there's something very important. When we swear, we put our hand on the Bible, we were saying, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. That means it's very legal. You better be careful what you say, because if you lie under oath, you could go to jail. So this angel standing on the sea, standing on the land, he raises his hand and says, I swear. So that means this is pretty serious stuff. This is something important. What's he going to say? Number three, write this down. A special or the special time. Special time. He says there will be time no longer. Now, some people get this confused because there will be a time when there will be no time. But it's not yet. When we get in New Jerusalem, time will be no more. We won't need a calendar. We won't need a watch. We won't need a clock because things will always be the same. Now, it's hard for me to comprehend that, and you too, because you're made out of the same dirt I'm made out of, and we got the same ability to comprehend but I can't imagine not having time but that's going to be eternity but that's not what this verse is talking about the word time there could be translated there will be no delay in other words here's what the angel saying or Jesus is saying he's raising his hand he says I swear now is the time the time is now this is it what There'll be no more delays. You remember the martyrs that died because they believed in Jesus. They got saved during the tribulation. They got their head cut off. The Antichrist cut off their head. And by the way, if you get saved during the, the, uh, the tribulation, you may lose your head because you won't put the mark of the beast on you. And he'll, he'll cut your head off. So, they cried out to God and they said, God, how long before you avenge us? Of this evil. And the Bible says earlier, it says, just a little longer till the rest of your brothers and sisters are martyred. But the day's coming. The day is coming. Well, now that day has come. And Jesus said, there's going to be no more delay. Now, we know time will continue on because there's a thousand year reign of Christ. So that's time is in years. But this is no more delay. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants of prophets. Now, this is a special time because he's saying the mystery is over. Now, let's put on our Sherlock Holmes hat again. What mystery? What's he talking about? He said, the mystery is over. I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure what he's talking about. There are some people that say the mystery that the Old Testament prophets preached. By the way, a mystery is something taught in the, uh, that is not known in the Old Testament, but is revealed in the New Testament. And some people say the mystery is why do wicked people prosper and people that are good suffer? 
That is a mystery that a lot of people wonder. Hey, I'm, a, I, you know, I'm trying to obey God. I'm trying to do right. Why do I have a hard time? But that's true, isn't it? Those that obey the Lord, those that do right, do have hard times, don't they? Is that what it's talking about? I do not know. Maybe it's the day of the Lord. This is the time when God is going to come. He's ready to come back, and it's the day of the Lord. It could be God revealing himself. People have wondered, is there a God? Guess what? They're not going to wonder anymore. Osama bin Laden will one day bow his knee to Jesus and say, Thou art Lord. Ahmadinejad will one day bow his knee and say, Jesus Christ is the only true God. Adolf Hitler one day will bow his knee and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee shall bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Maybe that is the mystery. That Jesus is Lord. There's no doubt about it. There's no mystery. He will reveal himself. Maybe that's it. Not sure. And then number four. I want you to see the sweet taste. Now this is really some weird stuff. This is about one of the weirdest things in all the Bible. Look at Revelation chapter 10. Look at verses 9 and 10. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but in thy mouth as sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the hand, out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. But as soon as I had eaten it, my belly became bitter. Now, you've got to admit, that's pretty weird. You remember we said that he's holding an open book. Why is it open? Because the seals have been opened. And he said, John, come here a minute and take his book. Now, this is the first time John's been seeing all this kind of as a spectator. But now John becomes a participant. He's asking John to do something. Before, he just said, write all this down. Now he's saying, John, come and take this book and eat it. And he said, when you taste it, it is going to be as sweet as honey. It is going to taste so good. But then after you swallow it, it's going to be bitter. After you digest it, after it gets down in your belly, it is going to be bitter. Now, this passage is talking about preaching and prophesying. Because it describes a preacher. He's saying, John, you've got to go and preach to a lot of people. This has got to go out, so you've got to eat the book. By the way, this isn't the first time this has happened. Can anybody tell me another prophet where he had to eat a book before he went and preached? Ezekiel did. God told Ezekiel to eat a book and then go and preach it. Now, what does that represent? It really describes what preaching is. He's saying... Before you preach something, it needs to be a part of your life. It needs to be real to you. You see, if I preach one thing and live another, I'm a hypocrite. Now, I'm not perfect. Someone said, you may not have arrived at the place that you're preaching about, but you did sure need to be on the road to getting there. And the truth is, I haven't arrived, but I better be on my way. And if anything describes preaching a true preacher, it's this, this little picture of eating a book. Because it's sweet at first, but it's bitter at the end. Now, some of you may not believe this, but it's true. I don't like a lot of what I have to preach about. I don't. Sometimes I know that I make people mad. And I don't want to make people mad. I want people to like me. Everybody wants people to like them, don't they? But do you know what? I have to take the Bible and preach what God says. There are certain things that I may not like about the Bible myself. But I've got to preach them. When it comes to prophecy, 
we begin to read it and we say, boy, this is exciting. Isn't this good? Boy, everybody wants to learn about prophecy. Everybody wants to learn about the second coming, don't they? But then you begin to digest it. You begin to study it and you see all the horrors and all the evil that's going to happen to people. You know, someone would say, I, I, boy, I wish I could tell the good news that Jesus came and died for you and Jesus loves you. That's good. That's sweet. But it's bitter when you look at it and say, but if you reject that love, you're going to spend an eternity in hell. People don't like to hear that. When I preach against homosexuality, some people say, well, you know, that's hate. We ought to just love everybody, no matter what they do. You know what? I, I would rather do that. I'd rather everybody love me and I just preach sweet little things. I can't do that. God said, eat the book. And when you eat it, it will be bitter. And I tell you, I'm tempted to just don't rock the boat. Just preach nice little things that everybody likes. People go away. Wasn't that a nice little Bible study Brother Carl gave? Wasn't that sweet little study? We could probably get a bigger church. Some of the big churches, that's all they teach. They don't talk about sin. They don't talk about hell. They don't talk about judgment. But one day they will give an account to God. And I tell you what, the worst on the judgment seat of Christ or the judgment day, whichever one, the people that will have the greatest condemnation will be preachers. The Bible says that. Preachers that say peace, peace when there is no peace. Preachers that say don't rock the boat, just, just say nice things to people and you know get your paycheck and everything be wonderful. But one day I'm going to stand before God and God's going to say not only did you sin but you led others into sin. That's why the greater condemnation will be on preachers. When a leader sins, he becomes a leader of sin. When a teacher sins, he becomes a teacher of sin. I have to preach the Bible because one day I will stand before God. And I know I've made people mad. I've got people that won't. I've had people cancel our newsletters because of things I've said. I can't change what I'm saying because I'm going to stand before God. We had some dear friends couple they were so nice they were a sweet couple and they liked us and I liked them and we went out to dinner one time but they were Roman Catholic and and I and, and y'all know me I'm not going to try to be mean on purpose <laughs> I may be mean but it's accidental but uh, you know I began to talk to them about how the Roman Catholic Church was wrong and uh, tried to do it in a nice way and I said let me give you a book about it and I gave them a book and it made them mad it offended them I didn't want to offend them but should I not tell them the truth see some people say this oh listen we can't offend people we better not be we better not look them in the eye and confront them we better not talk to them about the gospel because we'll run them off well if we're already going to hell where are you going to run them to no, that's a lie of the devil. But we've got to obey God. John, after he'd seen all this, after he sees the book of Revelation, and he goes back to Ephesus, he's, he's on Patmos. Remember, he's on the island of Patmos. But the Bible, uh, well, history teaches us, not the Bible, I'm sorry. History teaches us that another king became emperor and released John. And he went back to Ephesus and lived a little bit longer and preached. What kind of preacher do you think he was? I bet you he was a passionate preacher. After seeing all this, after seeing the horrors of the tribulation, after seeing what the pit of hell, don't you know he went and he begged people, come to Jesus. You're lost. You're going to hell. You're gonna, if you're in the tribulation, you'll go through such awful pain and heartache. You need to come today. Don't you put it off. Every day you put it off. You're playing Russian roulette with your soul. What if you died? What if you were in a car wreck? What if something happened? You'd be lost forever in hell. 
Don't you believe John had a passion? I tell you, God has been convicted me of my lack of passion. I need to get aggressive with sharing the gospel. And it, why is it that we can so easily begin to neglect sharing the gospel? I know it happens to me. I can get on fire, start talking to people about Jesus, and then I'll cool off and get cold. And then I, I don't talk to people. And you know what I need? I need the Holy Spirit to kick me in the pants about every month or two and say, get back to doing what I called you to do. Start talking to people about the gospel. Start passing out tracts. It's so easy. I, I know because it's true in my life and all of us. It's so easy to get cold in sharing the gospel. We can't do it. Every day we get closer. People are closer to going to hell. Every day we've got to get passionate about it. Let's bow for prayer.